from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? I'm Marcus Brockley. I'm the executive editor of the Washington Post. I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm glad that so many of you are here. On behalf of the Library of Congress, I'd like to welcome you to the 2012 National Book Festival. We're hope you having, we hope that you are having a wonderful day. It is a spectacular day, celebrating the joy of reading here on the National Mall. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here and to see so many people. It's really not a surprise that there should be so many people at a pavilion to hear David Marinus. He's such a prodigious writer. He's connected to just about every group that inhabits this town. He's written on sports with When Pride Still Mattered, his best-selling biography of Vince Lombardi, which also was made into a, a Broadway play. He also wrote Rome 1960, a book that captured the cultural epic set in motion by the Olympics that year. He's written on Vietnam and the cultural shockwaves that war sent through our country in his beautiful book, They Marched Into Sunlight, which I saw last year rendered interestingly as modern dance. He's written books on politicians, Newt Gingrich and Al Gore, and of course, he's a master biographer of the last two Democratic presidents, with first in his class, which was published while Bill Clinton was still in office, and Barack Obama, the story, his epic and fascinating account of the president's early life. He's even written on writing. So let's see, Democrats, Republicans, sports, journalists, the military, counterculture, Rome, it's no surprise that so many people are here. David grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, the son of a newspaper editor. He jokes that he's the intellectual weak link in the family with all his siblings, professors, expert in languages. We at the Post don't buy that. He's won a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 1993 for his coverage of candidate Bill Clinton. He's also a three-time Pulitzer finalist who has edited considerable other prize-winning work in his 35 years at the Post. Today, he is an associate editor at the paper. He says that means he doesn't have to associate with editors which isn't really true because he continues to write and edit, edit for us and in fact has overseen some of the fine work we've done this year on Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. What sets David's writing apart is his reporting though. I personally know how good a reporter he is. In his latest book, he describes what things were like on Morningside Heights in New York when a young Barack Obama transferred to Columbia University to join the class of 1983. I was in that class, oblivious I should say to the arrival or the president presence of the future president. Somehow David in his book managed to go back and describe every dive establishment we frequented, every study routine that the young students followed, every rhythm of that urban campus, all in vibrant nostalgia inducing detail. He's an astonishingly good reporter and a wonderful writer and I'm pleased to work alongside him and to introduce him here today. Thank you. Uh, I've been to this event three times and the tents keep getting bigger. It's quite amazing and especially on a Sunday afternoon during the football season. I guess there are no RG3 fans here or they're watching it on their smartphones. Um, President Obama was in my home state, Wisconsin, yesterday and of course he had a couple of bratwursts and uh, his first words were uh, sort of a, a reiteration of, of the line that made him famous but this time he said you know, we're not uh, Bears fans first or Packers fans first, but we're Americans first. Uh, so not red states or blue states, but the United States. Um, I know there aren't that many football fans here today. They wouldn't be here if they, if they were. But, but my first story about uh, President Obama actually has to do with, with football. Uh, he was the last interview that I did for my book. I had interviewed 350 people before him and traveled the world. And I thought about what I would, how I would break the ice with him for a long time. And I, I remembered that he is a Bears fan and I am a Packers fan. And that two years ago, uh, when the Packers played the Bears in the NFC Championship game, President Obama announced that if the Bears won, he was going to the Super Bowl. And the Packers won. And uh, the star player on the Packers, after the game, got up on the table in the dressing room and said, President Obama won't come see us, well, we're going to go see him at his house. M meaning if you win the Super Bowl, you get to visit the White House. This was Charles Woodson, their star cornerback. So I, when I finally got my interview with, with President Obama, I, I shook his hand and said, uh, Mr. President, Charles Woodson got here before me, 
but I'm glad we both finally made it. And he said, yeah, man, those Packers were rough on me. And I said, well, of course they were. You're a, you're a Bears fan. And he said, yeah, but every time I go to Wisconsin, they give me another share of Packers stock, <laughs> which is true. And he keeps going, and he'll be there. Well, he was there yesterday. He'll be there again because it's a, it's a swing state. So he has more shares of Packers stock than I do. Uh, this is my 10th book, and I had written a biography of Bill Clinton in the, uh, right after he was elected in 1992 and after covering his campaign for the Washington Post. And I'd written some major profiles of, of Barack Obama in 2008. So there was kind of an assumption that, that I would probably embark on his biography after that election if he won. And I have to say that... Uh, it wasn't that obvious to me. It was one of the most difficult decisions I've made as a, as a writer for over the last 20 years. And it had nothing to do with, with Barack Obama. It had to do with the modern American political culture, which I thought was sick and getting sicker. Um, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to endure uh, undertaking a serious historical biography about a sitting president and getting thrown back into the maw of this increasingly sick culture. Uh, in the end, on election night, late that night, I, I realized that I did want to tell this story, that I'd spent uh, a year already uh, trying to figure out Barack Obama, and that I thought his story was amazing uh, in so many ways, and it was something that I was obsessed with, and I, only, I tried to only write books about things that obsess me. The story that, that drew me to Barack Obama was not uh, his presidency or even his politics. It was two things. First was the utter randomness of his very being. The world that created him fascinated me. And I saw in his story a way to write about the modern world in so many different ways. And the second part that obsessed me was, okay, given his circumstances, given the contradictions that life threw at him as a biracial kid born in Hawaii, uh, how did he figure himself out? How did he recreate himself? And that's what this book is about. Some people come to it thinking that they're going to read a traditional uh, biography that starts the day he was born. That was not what I ever intended. It's a book about the world that created Barack Obama and how he recreated himself. And I was hoping that through that, uh, people would learn uh, lessons about him and why he is the way he is, which is really what I always try to do in all of my books, explain the forces that shape someone. My mantra as a journalist uh, has always been, go there, wherever there is. For my book on Vince Lombardi, that meant turning to my wonderful wife in 1996 and, and uttering the uh, immortal loving words, how would you like to move to Green Bay for the winter? <laughs> uh, she did it, and uh, it was only by living up there in Green Bay and enduring a winter and being in a company town where you understood that, that the Packers were everything, not the only thing. Uh, after a week, she said she felt out of uniform and had to go to Kohl's and buy a green and gold sweatshirt. Uh, everything about it was essential to that. And I've been making it up to her ever since. So, of course, it was a lot easier to say, how would you like to go to San Juan for the winter to study Roberto Clemente or to Rome for many uh, weeks to study the Rome Olympics. But this book about Barack Obama is the one that took us on a journey unlike any I've endured before. Uh, we traveled uh, more than 60,000 miles around the world uh, to Kenya and to Indonesia, many times to Hawaii, Kansas, and then Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, uh, the sort of the stations of the cross of Barack Obama's life and the life of his family. Going to Kenya, uh, for the first time what was a truly amazing experience and started uh, me on the way of understanding the cycles 
of the Obama family's life and in piercing some of the mythology that had built up around him, uh, which was part of the sickness of the American culture today, the, the wrong-headed mythologies about him. But we, uh, of course, arrived in Nairobi and then took this amazing seven-hour drive uh, from, the, the state, from the capital of Kenya all the way out to the shores of Lake Victoria, a drive that I'll never forget, partly because I wasn't sure that we would survive it. Uh, all along the way, there were, um, of course, cattle and sheep and people along the sides of the road and baboons, but also corrupt policemen who every 50 miles or so would throw down these long boards full of nails trying to stop people to collect bribes. Um, that was countered by the incredible beauty of this drive, going from Nairobi through the central province to the, into the Rift Valley, the oldest uh, valley of mankind, this gorgeous drop into the valley, and then down past that to the uh, vast seas of tea plantations out near Caricho, and then on lower into the marshlands and the heat around Lake Victoria, which is where the Luo tribe, the tribe from which the Obamas come, uh, is centered. Uh, there are several interesting aspects to that part of the story that I could only learn by being there. One is that, you know, there's a, there's a tendency on, on the part of of people who don't want to accept President Obama for various reasons, to think of him as some kind of an alien or stranger. Um, I'll get to that part of his story later, but even as I got out into Lake Victoria, I discovered that the Obamas, uh, two generations back, his grandfather, Hussein Anyango, was called a Jadak, a stranger. Um, by, the, by, by the chief of that area who didn't like him. And he was called a stranger, not because he, was, he hadn't been born there, but because four generations back, the Obamas had come from another part of, of, of Western Kenya. Um, and there was this notion that they weren't really of that place and that he was not legitimate. And in fact, Hussein Anyango ended up leaving uh, the village of Kanyadiyang and going 80 miles back to the original homeland because of that a rejection, in a sense. One of the, the myths that some people try to spread about Barack Obama, uh, as you've all heard, is that he's somehow a secret Muslim. Uh, it's, a, it's a venal idea that has no grounding in fact, but the reality is something far more interesting uh, in sort of the unwitting aspects of history. In fact, what I discovered all through my study in Kenya was that it was conservative evangelical Christians from the United States who made the rise of the Obamas possible every step along the way, and that Muslims, in fact, had nothing to do with it. It was Seventh-day Adventists who came out to the shores of Lake Victoria, uh, to Kendu Bay uh, at the turn of the 20th century and started setting up a school at which Barack Obama, President Obama's grandfather Hussein Anyango learned English and became westernized. Uh, it was a, a Anglican missionary school in Maseno, uh, the Maseno School, where uh, Barack Obama Sr., the president's father, was tutored and trained and westernized. Uh, and it was a fascinating American woman named Betty Mooney whose grandfather was the founder of Texas Christian University, who arrived in Kenya in the late 1950s to spread literacy and the gospel, who essentially embraced Barack Obama Sr. and mentored him and made it possible for him to come to the United States. Uh, Betty Mooney, uh, in her teaching of literacy, uh, was, was translating uh, her, her literacy books into various tribal languages in Kenya, one of which was Luo, and she hired Barack Obama Sr. To, to do the Luo translations for that book. She then encouraged him to come to the United States to study. She helped pay his way here, and it was in her offices that she and Barack Obama Sr. were looking, leafing through an old copy of, of Look Magazine and saw this article about 
the University of Hawaii, this wonderfully polyglot place that happened to have uh, beauty queens of seven different nationalities. Uh, and Barack Obama Sr. thought, well, maybe this is somewhere in the United States where I might feel more at home. He'd only read at that point about the early stages of the civil rights movement and the difficulties uh, that, a, that an African might have in the United States. Um, and it was really because of reading that story and because of Betty Mooney and because of one other figure, an amazing Kenyan named Tamboya, who was also a Luo and a leading figure in Kenya of that moment, um, who was connected to the West and who was trying to, to build a new nation, working toward the independence of Kenya, and really helped sponsor and organize the first wave of Kenyans to come to the United States in 1959 uh, to be trained and educated in order that they might work toward independence, which would come a few years later. The other side of the story, the, the uh, white side of the story, is really one of classic American searching. It begins in Kansas in, on Thanksgiving night of 1926 when a woman named Ruth Armour Dunham committed suicide in a dank auto garage in Topeka, Kansas. She left behind two sons, Ralph and Stanley. Stanley was eight years old. He was the grandfather of President Obama. He moved then to a small town in Kansas where his grandparents lived, El Dorado, Kansas. Uh, the first iteration of people in that family living with their grandparents. He also, when he got to El Dorado, was living not only with his grandparents, but his great-grandfather, a man named Christopher Columbus Clark. And it's amazing to think about this aspect of that relationship. Stanley Dunham is living with Christopher Columbus Clark, his great-grandfather, who fought in the Civil War for the North, for the Missouri militia at a very early age. That same Stanley Dunham would grow up to be the grandfather of the first African-American president of the United States. That vast sweep of history really connected by one man. Stanley Dunham in so many other ways was what I call a, a combination of uh, Willie Loman and Walter Mitty. He had all of these dreams that he couldn't realize. Uh, he was a, a a fast talker, uh, he, he dropped out of high school and then came back and graduated and went out to California. And when he came back to Kansas after his first trip to California, he said that he was a writer. And out in California, he had befriended John Steinbeck and William Saroyan, and he was writing himself and had all of these uh, writings in, the, in his trunk that he brought back with him. That notion was very, uh, profoundly impressionable on a young woman who grew up in a nearby town of Augusta, Kansas, uh, named Madeline Payne, who had this sensibility that she didn't want to be trapped in a small town. She had these yearnings to be sophisticated and get, get out of small town Kansas. Her heroine was Betty Davis. She would go to the theater in, in Augusta, Kansas, and watch Betty Davis on the screen and wanted to model that sense of sophistication. She started smoking with a cigarette holder and changing the way uh, her, her vocabulary and even her, her, uh, her diction. And so she runs across this guy who's, who's working in an oil, building a new oil field, uh, plant in, in Augusta named Stanley Dunham, who claims that he'd been to California and and knew William Saroyan and John Steinbeck was his writer and she fell head over heels for him. And that's really the beginning of their relationship. Uh, they very quickly have a daughter who is the President Obama's mother and her name, like her father, is Stanley Dunham. Now the assumption would be, of course, well, this is a, a typical sexist father who wanted a boy and so therefore didn't get one and, and imposed this name Stanley on, on his daughter. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story that even the president thought was true, but I discovered something utterly different, which was it was the mother who gave Stanley that name, and it's because of Betty Davis. 
1942, a few months before she was born, Betty Davis was in a movie in which she played a woman named Stanley. And that's where it came from. Stan Dunham, the, the father, was constantly searching from that point on. He, you know, they, he took the family to Oklahoma and back, to Texas and back, to Seattle, to suburban uh, Mercer Island, where, where the daughter, uh, Stanley, went to junior high school and high school, and then finally out to Hawaii. And they arrived in 1960, one year after this African, uh, Barack Obama Sr. had arrived in Hawaii, and they met in a Russian class and very quickly thereafter uh, was born President Obama. Now, of course, another part of the, uh, the mythology is that uh, Obama wasn't, President Obama is illegitimate uh, president because he wasn't born in the United States. I, I don't know if there are any birthers in this audience, um, but if there are, here is the conspiracy that would have had to have existed for that to be true. The conspiracy would have had to involve, first of all, the local newspapers, which ran the birth announcement of Barack Obama Jr. It would have had to involve the, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which was tracking Barack Obama Sr. week by week for that entire period, because he was, he was in the United States on a student visa, and the, I, and the INS didn't like him. They thought he was a womanizer, which he was, and also they thought he was a bigamist, which he was. Uh, he had been married a couple of years earlier in Kenya and had not gotten a divorce. And so when, when, when he married uh, Stanley Dunham, the, by American standards, he was a bigamist. By Luo standards, he claimed that in their culture, he could just denounce his former wife and say he was no longer married to her, and that amounted to a divorce. The third element of the conspiracy would have had to involve the doctors and nurses at Kapiolani Medical Center. The week that Barack Obama Jr. was born, uh, Barack, Obama, Barack H. Obama II, pardon me, was born, August 4th, 1961. The, the word went around that, that week about something peculiar that had happened. Uh, one of uh, a, a journalist there took out one of the, the better known doctors in Honolulu and said, anything interesting happened to you this week? And he said, well, at our hospital, Stanley had a baby. <laughs> it's not every week that Stanley has a baby. Nurses and doctors remember it. And they remembered it. And I found them and talked to them about it. And here, But in any case, here is born Barack Obama, President Obama, biracial, a Kenyan father, white mother, in Hawaii. In one sense, you might say that that is the luckiest place in the United States he could have been born. Uh, Hawaii is that multiracial place full of what are called hapa, half and half, a native Hawaiian term for people. Uh, there are so many Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese, Hawaiian, uh, Haole, which is the word for Anglo. Uh, there, everybody is some form of hapa. One of one of a, one of Barack Obama's friends in high school's name was Tom Topolinski. Sounds Polish. He was Chinese. <laughs> it's that kind of place. But in another sense, it was difficult for him because uh, he was born with. Uh, black skin, he's an African American uh, by, by birth. Very few African Americans in Hawaii, the only ones there were uh, mostly connected to the military bases in Honolulu. So in the one sense from the day he was born he had to deal with race in America, in another sense he had no cultural uh, acclimation to that. He was living with his mother uh, and his grandparents at various points and his life from that point uh, for the next first 28 years of his life, really, is a search for self-identity, uh, which is the second half of my book, how he figured himself out. He's only six years old when his mother, after uh, divorcing Barack Obama Sr., with whom she really never lived, um, falls in love again, this time with an Indonesian. 
and Barack Obama, age six, arrives in Jakarta, Indonesia. And it was only when I went to Jakarta uh, that something that is incredibly obvious uh, washed over me in a more profound way. Barack Obama at age six was not in the protective cocoon of being a, a diplomat's kid uh, going to the international school. He was completely immersed in that culture. And it was only when I was in the neighborhood where he lived when he arrived there, Mentang Dalam, and walked through the narrow alleyways and heard the street vendors click, click, and, and saw the kids playing on the, in the street and went to the local school um, and thought about this six-year-old kid, Barry, as his family called him. As a matter of fact, in Indonesia for those three years, he was Barry Satoro. He took the, the last name of his stepfather, Lolo Satoro, to make life a little easier for him. So here he is, this six-year-old kid in Mentang Dalam, Jakarta, sinking or swimming, learning the, having to learn the local language, Bahasa Indonesia, going to the local school, playing with the local kids. And it was then that it washed over me, what an incredible, whatever your politics are, whatever, to think about the incredible journey from Barry Satoro, age six in Jakarta, to President Obama here in Washington in the White House. When he was 10, uh, his mother sent him back to Hawaii to live with his grandparents. Uh, she had been waking up at five in the morning to, to uh, homeschool him along with the, the, the learning in the local school. And by the way, the other element of that Muslim myth is that when he was in Hawaii, was it when he was in Indonesia, he went to a madrasa. It's complete garbage. Uh, he went to school, two schools in uh, Jakarta. The first one was a Catholic school, Estia Sisi, and the second one was the most prestigious of the local public schools, Esti Basuki, um, where because Indonesia is 80% Muslim and, and sort of has this uh, interesting tradition where the Muslims came late, but before that there were layers of, of Hindu and Buddhists in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the archipelago of Indonesia. Uh, but because of the Muslim dominance, the schools teach an hour of religion every, every week, and o Obama had to go to that. Uh, but the central uh, inculcation at that school had nothing to do with being a Muslim. It had to do with Pankasia, which is the sort of the, the nationalist notions that were uh, conceived by uh, the first independent leaders of Indonesia. Uh, no, no great shakes, these, these uh, dictators, uh, Suharto, Sukar, Sukarno and Suharto, but they were trying to bring together the incredible diversity of Indonesia and created this Pankasia notion, which embraced all of the cultures and all of the religions. And the actual fundamentalist Muslims, the few that were in Indonesia, hated that. Uh, they thought it was being too embracing. That's what Obama was learning then, a measure of diversity, and in no way was being inculcated as a Muslim. In any case, age 10, he leaves, goes back to, to Honolulu, um, to, and he's lucky that his grandparents both worked for, for influential figures. His, mo his grandmother uh, worked at a bank, or his dad at an uh, insurance company, and the presidents of both those companies were on the board of directors of the elite prep school in Honolulu, the Puno School, and Barack Obama tested well and got into that school. Um, but from that point, age 10 on, um, essentially he was trying to figure out who am I? Uh, this biracial kid, African-American by the imposition of society, uh, uh, trying to make his way. Um, in, in high school, you saw absolutely no notion that he would someday be President Obama. I compare him in that sense with the other uh, president that I've written about, Bill Clinton. Billy Clinton uh, was running for president from the day he was born. Uh, when, when he was in high school, he ran for every office possible, so much so that when he was a senior, his principal, uh, Johnny May Mackey, came to him and said, Billy, we're sick of you. You dominate everything. You can't run for class president. So he said, okay, I'll run for class secretary, which in that era was a sexist position. You know, in the sexism of that era, it was always a, a, a girl. Clinton ran against his girlfriend. She beat him. 
He wouldn't talk to her for weeks. Then, of course, he got here to Georgetown University and ran for, he was freshman class president, sophomore class president. And in his junior year, he ran for senior president and got beat again because his peers were sick of him. You see, none of that with, with Barry Obama. In high school, he was a smart kid. Uh, his teachers liked him. He didn't exert himself much. Uh, he basically played basketball and smoked dope, and that was about it. He didn't show any of the political inclinations whatsoever. He got to Occidental College, finally got off the island at age 17, started his college career. And that's really where you see this, this long 10-year arc toward home. It starts in Los Angeles at Occidental College, uh, where he, he's, he feels a spark for the first time. Not quite sure where it's going to take him, but he started to talk about this sense of destiny. His mother, uh, the amazing uh, Stanley Ann Dunham, would constantly pound into him, bear, bear she would call him, you're special. You're, you're here for a reason. You've got all of this, these abilities. You, you can't just be a good time Charlie. And when he got to Occidental, he started to think about that more and really about what his purpose was. But after two years in Los Angeles, it was too much like Punahou, his, the prep school he went to. It was, it was upper middle class. It was sun-washed. It was easy. He wanted to get more closer to the grid of, of America. And he transferred to Columbia. Um, and was in the class with, with my uh, editor, Marcus Broccoli. Uh, he was actually in New York for four years. And to me, it's, it's one of the most important, misunderstood uh, four years of his life. Because even though he came to New York, ostensibly to be closer to the heart of, Afri of African American uh, America, uh, he instead became a complete introvert for those four years. He went to Columbia for two years, and as he told me in the White House, he made no lasting African-American friends. He was reading and studying and trying to figure himself out. He carried a copy, a, 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 a tattered copy of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man with him for months. Uh, and he wrote. He wrote in his journal. Um, he wrote letters. Uh, and there's one letter that I got that he wrote to a, a girlfriend that he'd made at Occidental, where he talked about how all of his friends from, from Punahou School, from Occidental, the new, fr the new people he was meeting at Columbia, all seemed to be sort of finding their niche in the world. They were either going into the business world or some other world, or, but starting to associate with a, a narrow niche of life. And he wrote to his girlfriend, you know, in a sense I envy them, but I know that for my life to have meaning because of who I am, I can't except that narrow niche. I have to try to embrace it all. And that letter, when I saw it, to me was the first iteration of the speech he gave in Boston in 2004, by which everybody in this room first got to know him. That notion of him representing the diversity of this world and of America, and that that was his reason for being. Um, he spent four years in New York, to, after graduating from Columbia, he, he wanted to follow his mother into some form of public service of community organizing. Uh, when he graduated from Columbia in 1983, he applied for a job. Harold Washington had just been elected the first African-American mayor of Chicago. Uh, Barack Obama, just graduated from Columbia, being utterly, utterly naive, applied for a job in the Harold Washington government not realizing that you don't do that in Chicago. You know, it's who, who do you know, who brung you? Um, so he didn't get hired. Um, he spent another two years in New York. And then finally, in 1985, a group on the south side of Chicago uh, that was trying to organize the steel workers, uh, they were pretty successful in organizing white areas of, of, on the south suburbs of Chicago, but were trying to make inroads into uh, the African-American South Side uh, needed somebody to do that organizing work and they hired Barack Obama. And he came to, to Chicago in 1985. Three people arrived in that city, which is kind of the, the pole star in my mind of, of black life in, in the United States. Three people arrived within six months of one another then. The first was Oprah Winfrey, 
The second was Michael Jordan, and the third was Barack Obama. Two became, of course, world famous within a few months. Uh, Barack Obama arrived utterly anonymous and unknown except for a grand uncle who was a librarian at the University of Chicago. But those early years in Chicago, three years as a community organizing organizer, are what really set Barack Obama on the path for the rest of his life. It's where his whole, li his whole adult life from that point, from the time he left Honolulu to then, I consider an arc toward home. He really didn't have a home. You know, his mother, for much of his teenage years, was in Indonesia while he was in, in Honolulu. His father, he'd only met once in his life when he was 10 years old for a few weeks, and it wasn't a very pleasant experience. Uh, he was living with his great-grandparents who were doing the best they could, but, but could not really provide everything to him, although his grandmother, uh, that Stanley and Dunham, the, the uh, the Betty Davis wannabe uh, turned into being this, the rock of the family and really supported everybody uh, from, from the time that Barry was born. But nonetheless, he was searching for a real place in the world and he got to Chicago and two things happened. First of all, in his job as a community organizer uh, in Roseland, this neighborhood on the far south side of Chicago, he was embraced by this group of middle-aged black women who just filled him up with the chaos and love of their lives. And it was something that he'd never really felt before. And it was something that sort of um, overwhelmed him in a positive way that he was feeling this sensation for the first time, feeling a personal sense of home, knowing that that's where it would be. Secondly, as a community organizer, uh, you know, you lose 95% of the time. You just keep pounding away at, at the powers that be. And o Barack Obama during that whole period was intently studying power and how one could use it um, to affect change. And he was watching Harold Washington for the first part of that and realized uh, that for him to get where he wanted to go, he had to get into electoral politics. He could only do so much as a community organizer. And it was then when he made that realization that he applied to Harvard Law School and he went to Kenya for the first time to trace his African roots. And that's really where I end this story, uh, this first volume of my story of Barack Obama. Uh, as he's leaving Chicago after being in Kenya and heading up toward Harvard Law School. The old blue Honda Civic was gone. He had sold it before departing for Europe and Africa. Now he had another car, a used yellow Datsun that cost $500. A hole would grow in the floorboard, but the engine was good enough to get him where he had to go. No life could have been more the product of randomness than his. From the heritage of Hussein Anyango, the Jadak, the stranger, and Ruth Armour Dunham, the young suicide victim. From a chance meeting of, of students in Russian class in Honolulu. From the chaos of peripatetic ancestors, from a childhood in distant Hawaii and more distant Indonesia, from the rootless feelings of a double outsider as a biracial and cross-cultural kid. And after nine years, starting from the moment he reached Occidental and the mainland, of intense introspection, trying to figure things out to make sense of his life, from all that he had found not only a home, but a path, and was driving hard now toward Harvard Law, a stop on the way to his family's unimaginable destination, his own El Dorado. Thank you very much. I have time to take a few questions, which I'll be happy to do. Yes, sir. Uh, in your book on President Clinton, there are enough, uh, plenty of juicy parts that you must have had some fun doing that book. Did you have any fun doing this one? Well, it was fun to find his girlfriends. <laughs> so I'll tell you one story about, the, there's a, you know, people have made too much of this in one sense, but 
Uh, in his memoir, he writes about, I loved a girl in New York once, and she was white. And once every, any journalist in the United States who read that in his book, there was a, you know, who is it? Find her. I knew that I couldn't write this book without finding her. It took me two and a half years. Uh, at first, I didn't have anything to go on. Then, finally, uh, one of his friends said I, that he had a letter, an envelope in which another friend had written, oh, by the way, Barry broke up with Genevieve. So I had a first name. For a year and a half, my two researchers and I put every possible permutation of Genevieve, New York, into the computers. This is one good thing that, that the internet has done. And we kept going over it and over and over it until finally um, I found a wedding announcement in the New York Times that rang a bell with me because it mentioned uh, a Genevieve whose parents were Australian and one of the friends had said she, he thought this girlfriend had an Australian accent uh, who had been married in a posh part of Northwest Connecticut and in Obama's memoir he writes about going to this place in New England that sounded a little bit like that. And the parents also had lived in Indonesia and had been divorced, but everything, all of those things, Australia, Indonesia, Connecticut rang bells. So then it was a search to try to find the, the woman of that name. Uh, I went into the court records and found that she changed her name again. She'd been divorced and remarried. We had a third name, uh, found a telephone number many thousands of miles away. I, I had just gotten back from overseas at jet lag. At two in the morning, I placed a call. Um, is this Genevieve Cook? Yes, it is. This is David Marinus. And she said, how did you ever find me? <laughs> and I proceeded to tell her. And then I was talking, and you know, she was probably Googling me at the same time. And after 15 minutes, I knew that this would work because she was kind of new agey, and for some reason, new agey women like me, because uh, I'm kind of soft. So anyway, the relationship evolved from there, and she was incredibly forthcoming. I was totally straightforward with, with her. My policy always is no surprises. I'll let people know exactly what I'm doing at all times. And after about three weeks, uh, she'd read more about me and read a, uh, an interview with me um, uh, where I was describing another book I did on Vietnam and a battle, and I said how memories of a battle uh, are one thing, but they're not really reliable. You have to balance those with, with uh, primary documents, contemporaneous documents. Genevieve wrote to me, Dear David, I read your interview about primary documents. By the way, I kept a journal. <laughs> and that's where that all came from. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about Barack Obama and community organizing. Sure. You mentioned in your talk that this was a revelation to him about the need to get electoral power to make the real changes he needed, but there must have been other lessons. Oh, many, many lessons from community organizing, and thanks for asking. One of the, one of the ironic things about Barack Obama is he wasn't a classic community organizer. Um, his mentors there were frustrated by him because he wouldn't confront enough. Um, but that's his style. He has enough, I mean, I say about Barack Obama, you know, some people on the left or liberals tend to misinterpret his actions. They think, why isn't he doing more? Why isn't he, you know, clarifying things and fighting harder? My sense of Barack Obama, he's always trying to look two steps ahead. Where is the next trap? And that's what he was doing as community organizer. That's what he's done as president. You know, the trap of being born on an island, the trap of being born biracial, the trap of Chicago politics. He's always looking beyond that. And that's what he was doing as a community organizer, too. I mean, it, first of all, it infused him into the black community. He learned um, about where the real levers of power are and how to try to truly affect change. He learned the values of grassroots organizing, which he used certainly in his campaigns. Um, and it got him, you know, he, he was, uh, He's not, the, he's not a, an extrovert in a classic sense, but when he was in the South Side of Chicago, he'd walk into any house and talk to anybody. And that is something that is of value to someone who's a leader of the country. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, could you please comment on Dinesh D'Souza's movie, 2016? Uh, 
Uh, that movie is utter garbage from beginning to end. It's not an ounce of, it's a classic example of why I almost didn't want to write this book, but why I'm glad I did. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. The notion that Barack Obama is infused by this anti-colonial sensibility. I mean, even if he were, uh, what was so great about colonialism? <laughs> but, but secondly, it's, not, it's a complete misunderstanding of him. And uh, the way that the right wing has taken a shard of fact and twisted it into this conspiracy is uh, really, really depressing. Yes, Can you briefly go over the book Invisible Man and how you think that was significant to Obama? Well, you know, it's a, it's a very different book. Uh, it, the, the main character in that book is different from Obama in every sense except one. Uh, Barack Obama in New York felt like he was Invisible Man. Uh, that, that he was seeing the world and nobody was seeing him as he was. And I think that was... Uh, along with a, a way of him getting to understand American culture more deeply through novels. And, and Barack Obama in those years was thinking that maybe he would be a novelist. Um, so even on a literary level, it was important to him. More deeply, it was helping him understand the depth of, of, of the history of African Americans' existence in this country and the, you know, the, the way that they can see, see the world that the world can't see them. And I think that's what he was dealing with. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that President Obama used cannabis in Hawaii. Uh, apparently, he learned to inhale. Yes, very well. Did he ever learn to exhale? Well, you know the story about Bill Clinton that he didn't, uh, that he never inhaled. Uh, he was asthmatic. He probably never did. Uh, but he ate a lot of hashish brownies instead. <laughs> Barack Obama. I mean, you know, I, I have more detail about his dealings with the Chum Gang, you know, this fairly innocent group of guys in senior high school who, who smoked dope uh, at Bonohoe. Uh, uh, yes, he inhaled and exhaled and everything else. When will you or somebody write the biography of Stanley Ann Dunham? She must have been a remarkable woman. No, no, uh, Jenny Scott, uh, uh, who works at the New York Times, uh, did write that biography, and she is an incredible woman. And, uh, you know, she's in my book a lot. I don't know if you've read it, but I deal with her quite a bit. Yes, sir. Uh, what, what do you make of those who think Obama was not born in, in the U.S.? I mean, you couldn't say they are stupid because Donald Trump is a very intelligent man. So, I mean, what's, how, what do you make of this? Hatred and racism. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.